Okay, so we're going to start the um, Next Generation Logo webinar in just a moment. Um, good afternoon, um, good evening, or even good morning, wherever you are. Um, just to take you through um, just a few things that you might need to know before we go into this. I'm sure we've all done Zoom before, um, but just a brief overview that you might want to have your view in speaker view so that you can see the slides um, and whoever is we will be recording, we are recording this session, um, so that you can click offline and share with your colleagues in the computer. Um, and throughout the course of the presentations, please do ask questions in the chat box as we go. At the end, we'll have um, time for some a Q and A session, and we'll answer what I what we can. Um, due to time zone differences, our um, presenters have pre-recorded their presentation. So if there's something that you specifically want to ask an individual, please, please write that in the chat. We are going to um, make a, we're going to take a time for it so that you can uh, direct it to the right person and they will get back to you after the event. Um, so at this point, I would like to hand over to our host, um, Dr. Bob Campbell, who's Director of Energy um, and um, he'll take over from here. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, thank you all for joining us. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to uh, introduce our fantastic lineup of speakers that we have today. Um, we have Madeline Nolan, president of ATSC, uh, Anne Shelley, managing director of Pearl TV, Brian Markwater, SVP of Research and Standards for CTA. Uh, finally, Ron Wheeler, Managing Director of the ATSC 3 Security Authority. And I will talk a little bit at the end uh, about um, the work that Eurofins has been doing. Um, first off, though, I'll hand over to Madeline Noland, who, as ATSC President, is going to give us uh, a, a, an introduction and set the scene for how NextGen TV is shaping up today and where it's going in the future. Hello. My name is Madeline Noland. I'm president of ATSC, the Advanced Television Systems Committee. I'd like to thank Eurofins for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about ATSC 3.0 today and tomorrow, and how that fits in with conformance testing for this evolving platform. ATSC is a standards development organization. Our latest project is ATSC 3.0, the new system for digital terrestrial broadcasting. ATSC has many members all throughout this ecosystem, so that each stakeholder in the ecosystem has a voice in the development process. ATSC 3.0, which is our latest project, was the brainchild of almost 400 people with many people behind them in their teams within their respective organizations. It was really the best and brightest from across the globe and across the ecosystem. And so as a result, we really have a great system, but we also have a very flexible system, which makes it even harder to make sure that we have interoperability between broadcasts and receivers. So why did we even do ATSC 3.0? Well, we had some specific goals for the new system. One was that we wanted to add value to the broadcasting service platform. We needed to enable some new business models as well as reach more devices which consumers are using these days. And certainly the behavior on the consumer side has changed a lot. We need higher quality video, higher quality audio, better accessibility, better emergency messaging, and people want to watch what they want to watch and when they want to watch it, and honestly, on whatever device they want to watch it. So some changes had to be made. So what did we get with ATSC 3.0? Well, we got a much more efficient physical layer. What that means is we can send a lot more data through the same amount of spectrum as before. In fact, one HD program can probably take only about one tenth of the entire available spectrum of a single broadcaster. That's a major upgrade. ATSC 3.0 is the most efficient broadcast system in the world today. We also moved to a transport layer based on internet protocol, IP backbone. This is one of the most important things about the new system. 
For video, of course, we have major improvements of ultra high definition, high dynamic range, wide color gamut, high frame rate, scalable video, etc. And audio offers immersive audio, voice boost, personalization, and more. Applications are based on web technologies such as HTML5, um, CSS, and JavaScript, all of which are, should be native uh, languages for broadcasters' digital departments. And there's new accessibility capabilities with extra language tracks, voice boost, um, and uh, closed sign, lang sign language all possible. Advanced emergency messaging allows a wake up of devices and it allows geo targeting to avoid over alerting and a myriad of other features. Data casting is one of the most important things. This is a little bit less important for the consumer receiver market, but thinking about business to business use cases, we can now deliver data to the Internet of Things, which could include cars, smart agriculture, smart cities, digital signage, and it goes on. And also it is convergence ready, meaning that ATSC 3.0 can operate in a world where Wi-Fi, LTE, 5G, Bluetooth, all these other IP based delivery networks exist together. Let's put ATSC 1.0 in perspective for a minute. Our current system was built when we were on Windows 3.1. And we had dial-up modems, which delivered 19.2 kilobits per second. Pretty good, right? We had 2G analog cell phones, and we had analog VCRs, and we had ATSC 1.0, which for its time was absolutely state-of-the-art. However, ATSC 1.0 is a little bit older now, and we also wanted a more evolvable platform. So we think about ATSC 3.0 not as a one-time development project that finishes, but rather as a platform that evolves over time. So unlike previous standards, ATSC 3.0 is evolvable. Think about how web browsers can be updated frequently. Netflix applications can be updated frequently. Similarly, ATSC 3.0 has the ability to grow and change as the market demands change. ATSC is the organization that maintains and shepherds the system through into the future. So a little bit about the evolvability of ATSC 3.0, just a sort of a taste of the technology behind the scenes that allows this magic to happen. So as we mentioned, ATSC 1.0 is about 20 years old. So one of the key requirements that we wanted for ATSC 3.0 is that the system must be able to evolve in a backward compatible way. And there are many opportunities for innovation within the standard as it is today. So in other words, if we don't do any more development on the ATSC 3.0 standard, there are lots of opportunities for users of the standard, the broadcasters and the receiver makers. But for even more innovation, evolvability is built into the standard in many ways. We have a modular document architecture. We have extendable foundation technologies. We have the critical bootstrap, which uh, allows receivers to not be hard coded with uh, information, and it allows receivers to skip new things that they don't understand. And the physical layer pipe configuration is also a factor in allowing broadcasters to change services without orphaning their existing businesses. So as I mentioned, there is lots of room for innovation in today's standard. Many opportunities. So the web-based interactivity is really limited only by the content creator's imagination. We can do all kinds of things with CSS, HTML5, JavaScript, and the WebSocket APIs, which were developed specially for televisions. We also have a huge range of video, audio, and accessibility features yet to be tapped into. Up to 4K, HDR, wide color gamut, 120 frames per second, 22.2 channel audio, object-based audio, closed signing, multiple languages of captions, and audio, etc. What we're seeing in the early deployments in the marketplace is that we're using only a fraction of these capabilities. And as the uh, platform matures, we imagine that broadcasters and TV makers will both start to adopt more and more of these advanced features. And of course, the data casting is also ready to go today. There are no changes needed to the ATSC 3.0 standard to make these new business models possible. So in short, we're just scratching the surface of today's standards capabilities. But we have to be ready for tomorrow. 
and the day after that and the year after that. And we may be using this standard for a decade or more or two, so we need to be ready to add features. We have a modular document architecture. So ATSC is comprised, ATSC 3.0 is comprised of a suite of 20 plus documents, and each document can be updated and changed out and added to and subtracted on its own without impacting the other documents. Now we're gonna get a little bit technical, and I would joke and say that we're gonna have a quiz after this, but actually there is gonna be a test after this, so make sure you take some notes. So the extensible foundation technologies of ATSC 3.0 make it possible to make changes to ATSC 3.0 without disrupting existing devices and services. A couple of examples are on this slide. One example is XML-based signaling tables. In the past, we usually use binary signaling tables, and binary is a very inflexible signaling language. You really have to have a crystal ball in order to create the extensible possibilities that you're going to need from the beginning. And we don't always know what we're gonna need from the beginning. So for this standard, we move to XML, and that allows us to extend the signaling tables as needed without having to know in advance what those extensions might be. We're also using similar technologies like JSON and others, which are all uh, conducive to making changes to the standard without orphaning existing receivers and businesses. As I mentioned, the physical layer pipes are also important. These pipes each carry a part or a whole service, and a given physical layer pipe can be de dedicated to any one service or more than one service. But the point is that you can put a brand new service into a different physical layer pipe. And this service may not be something that older receivers understand, but newer receivers do. And the older receivers are able to skip this physical layer pipe and only decode the ones that they do understand. So it's a way of inserting new services and new features into the system without disrupting existing ones. The bootstrap is extremely important. And this is kind of a crazy concept, but it allows receivers to assume nothing. And for those of you who are building receivers, this is a very, very important slide. Because for example, in the past, a receiver might be built to assume that the bandwidth is six megahertz or eight megahertz or whatever the region is on. With the bootstrap, you actually signal how wide the bandwidth is. And that way the receiver doesn't need to be hard coded that the bandwidth is six megahertz or eight megahertz or whatever. It allows the receiver to dynamically adapt to whatever's happening in the signal. And it's not just the RF bandwidth, that's just an example. The bootstrap will tell the receiver everything it needs to know, including the size of the bootstrap. So right now there are four bootstrap symbols, but we could add a fifth one. And those receivers who understand the four symbols should parse those and skip the fifth one. So those of you that are designing receivers, watch out for the evolvability because it's coming. The other part about the bootstrap, which is actually critical, is that there's a, there's a signal in the bootstrap that tells the receiver when the next similar physical layer frame is coming. That means we could put in a brand new physical layer frame that has no relationship whatsoever to today's ATSC 3.0. And the receivers that understand the old system, the current 3.0 system, will skip those physical layer frames so that they won't have any difficulty trying to parse them. They just don't. And they move on to the next physical layer frame that they can understand. So as I say, ATSC 3.0 is a platform. Unlike previous standards, this platform can evolve, and ATSC, ATSC is the organization that is working on that. Happily, it's the ATSC members who do the work, and they're also the users of the system. So we certainly hope that we're gonna do exactly the right thing for this system for the users. So a little bit more about the conformance program for ATSC 3.0. As I mentioned, it's a very flexible platform, and that makes it actually a little bit difficult to build products that are interoperable with the broadcasters and what their plans are for services. So in September of 2019, 
the CTA, Consumer Technology Association, developed the Next Gen TV logo. And the Next Gen TV logo is something that consumers can use to understand which products that they can buy can, can decode the Next Gen TV signals or the ATSC 3.0 signals. So on the left there, you see Senator Gordon Smith, the president and CEO of NAB. There's myself in the middle and Gary Shapiro on the right, the president and CEO of CTA. This logo program and conformance test program program was a collaborative effort between the three organizations. So ATSC has a conformance implementation team. The purpose of the conformance implementation team is to think about the conformance program, the conformance test program, I said there was going to be a test, right? that would allow devices to earn the logo. Now, the conformance implementation team in ATSC does not administer the program and we do not create the program streams. But what we do is we figure out what are the test items that should be in the conformance program and what is the priority for making sure those are in the program. And that information is transmitted to the Consumer Technology Association who then develops the program itself. So the NAB, ATSC, and CTA collaborated. ATSC provided the prioritized item list. NAB and CTA collaborated to launch the logo program. CTA developed the logo. And products must pass the tests in order to earn the logo. And self-testing is possible. Now, I should add that all of this applies to products in the US market. CTA owns the logo and is the sole licensor of the logo. And there may be additional conformance requirements from two other entities, one which is the A3SA, which is for security, and the other is for audio with Dolby AC4, again, for the United States. So actually, we're doing pretty well here in the United States. Um, we have well just coming up on 20 markets that have ATSC 3.0 services, and more are coming online every every week. We expect by this time next year to be reaching about 75% of U.S. households. And we're also in the fourth year of commercial deployment in South Korea, where we're reaching 70% of US households. But again, I should emphasize the logo program applies to products that are intended for the US market. So next gen TVs are available now. Over 20 models have passed the initial conformance test and are available at retail today. So in summary, ATSC 3.0 is a platform. It allows broadcasters to grow and change without abandoning existing viewers and businesses. And there are many technical design decisions underneath the hood within the standard that make it possible. ATSC is the organization that maintains and develops the platform, enabling broadcasters to continually keep pace with market changes and business opportunities. The conformance test program keeps pace with developments in the marketplace and the standard. And the 2021 version of the conformance test program was recently announced. So be the first to know what's happening. Join ATSC and the ATSC conformance implementation team to stay ahead of all the developments and to forge critical relationships with stakeholders. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to our host, Eurofins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madeline. It's really quite amazing how flexible and uh, extensible ATSC3 is. And as a uh, conformance implementation team chair, I, uh, I really do encourage you to join ATSC and participate. We heard how broadcasters are already live with services. I'm now going to introduce Anne Shelley, Managing Director of Hello. Pearl TV, who is representing key broadcasters who are deploying Next Gen TV today. My name is Madeline Noland. I'm president of ATSC. Hi, my name is Ann Shelley. I'm Managing Director of Pearl Television, and I look forward to presenting an update on the deployment of next generation television in the United States. The future of television has arrived. In the US, we are rapidly deploying next generation broadcast television stations and working closely with manufacturers that have deployed models uh, at retailers uh, marketing these new services uh, in, in the U.S. 
So Pro Television is a business organization of nine of the largest broadcast station groups. We represent over 80% of U.S. households. These organizations uh, listed here have been working together uh, over the last seven years to develop uh, and implement the next generation television standard uh, that is currently being deployed in the U.S. We, uh, in terms of the work that we've been doing, uh, we've also been collaborating, collaborating with five networks. Uh, our, we've been up, up and operating in a market uh, in the US, Phoenix, uh, which is our model station. Developing content and security protection, transition and transmission models, basic, a basic television service profile that has been used to conform against uh, and enable the CTA. Uh, logo program, next generation TV AP formats, testing those, application and looking at monetization. We've also been working on uh, the cable integration. Uh, we have hopefully announcements coming up shortly here in the US about that. Of course, working closely with receiver manufacturers to ensure uh, that our services are of quality uh, and that consumers are receptive. We've done numerous consumer labs to understand what consumers want the most out of next generation television and also worked on a capability within the standard that is new to broadcast, which is the ability to deliver an application. And this application creates a hybrid television environment that allows us to enhance our contact, uh, co content, enable interactivity and do so much more with broadcast. These are some of our critical partners we've been working with. Uh, Eurofins is certainly one of them uh, to ensure that we have test profiles and, and test mechanisms to allow for conformance. But we've been involved in an open test bed. You can see the numerous uh, companies that have been involved here, top technology vendors, significant investment over the last two years going into next generation television in the US to ensure that we can support the services to consumers, which I'll be describing shortly. So it was almost two years ago, this coming spring, um, looking forward to 2021 spring, which I'm sure all of us are, uh, that we made the announcements broadcasters did that we would launch uh, the top 40 markets and even more than that, 61 markets uh, going into the end of 2019. Uh, with COVID, we are uh, at 20 markets, uh, and I'll talk about a website where you can find out information about what markets are on in the U.S. and when they're coming on in the U.S. Uh, we've uh, just recently made an announcement uh, today about Detroit coming on on air. Uh, Tampa was this past Monday. Uh, more to come, but 20 markets and some significant markets in the U.S. Uh, turning on this year despite COVID. We did have some delays, uh, at least late spring and early summer, just simply because we could not access station infrastructure. But I'm pleased to say that we have enabled uh, 20 markets and we are shortly following that with at least 20 more. We'll be approaching the top 40 markets uh, by mid-June and certainly uh, projecting more than that going into 2021. So here's our 24-month projection. You can see what I just mentioned. Uh, our goal is certainly to get to top 75% uh, of households, uh, uh, you know, looking into 21 and 20, 2022, but we certainly will have significant penetration early into next year, uh, getting ready for the new manufacturers and more models that will be coming out at CES uh, so that we can uh, promote those going into the spring and summertime. So how do we think about the basic television uh, deployment? Uh, as I mentioned, we have about 20 markets up on air. Uh, we've been working uh, hard and closely with uh, TV manufacturers and with the emission vendors to ensure that there's a, a quality level of service being offered to consumers, ensuring that there's stability. This is a 2000 page standard that in just a short period of time since it, its adoption by the FCC to allow us to transmit uh, in this new uh, uh, platform that, you know, 
we needed to do the work we did in Phoenix to ensure that there's interoperability. Uh, kudos to CTA uh, for developing a next generation TV logo program and a conformant program working with their, uh, their members, which are the TV manufacturers, uh, working closely with companies like Eurofins to do uh, the conformance test suites and test materials. All of this is really important. We encourage manufacturers that are interested in enabling next generation to carry that logo because that logo meets uh, the service that we will be emitting. So as we think about it, you know, we're stabilizing this year, but we're very much promoting uh, next gen. We're working with more manufacturers going into 2021. And we really are, will start to see, uh, I think, significant scale going into uh, going into 2022 uh, as we are built out. We're offering more services, uh, enabling new features and capabilities, which this platform allows us to do. It's upgradable for the future. So, what can a consumer expect uh, in the early days of next generation TV? So we will be simulcasting our 1.0 service into 3.0. Uh, that simulcast will allow for higher quality video, uh, plus uh, upgrade in the Dolby Audio System voice quality. Uh, two significant features that play that in consumers showed a lot of interest in in our labs was the ability to hear the voice more clearly. Uh, that has been branded by CTA's Voice Plus and consistent loudness. We also have immersive audio and the ability to deliver multiple audio tracks. The interactive aspect of the application is also of interest. We have the ability to deliver rich media alerts. We're testing this out in multiple markets right now as I speak. We do see that and believe that network sports content stunting, that's the ability to showcase uh, the high format, next gen TV high formats uh, will be available to us in 2021, making this a much more exciting platform. Uh, as I speak, there are 20 high end models that are available in the US. Uh, Samsung, LG, and Sony are available at Best Buy, Costco, and local retailers. Uh, we expect many more to come in 2021. So to let consumers know about NextGen, we've launched the NextGen uh, website, which is www.watchnextgentv.com. Consumers can come here to find out uh, everything they need to know about NextGen. They can even purchase TVs uh, from the three manufacturers off this website. I encourage you to go to it. We show markets. You can toggle over the markets and see when services will be available. You can also see the TV stations that are transmitting in next generation television. And here's an example of that website and how you can purchase. Portland, a terrific market. We're actually promoting in Portland. We've created a TV spots that are running right now for the holiday season across all of these stations, uh, promoting next gen and letting consumers know where to go buy the services, how to buy them, and why they should buy them. Uh, you can take a look at some of our ad campaign on the website uh, in the sizzle reel that pops up right when you uh, go onto the website. Here's some of our social campaign that's out there promoting the future of television, uh, the ability for it to be interactive, and to really create a much better live linear experience. So that's where we stand with Next Generation TV. Much more to come in 2021 as we expand and scale this new service. Uh, we are uh, excited to promote the Next Generation television brand. So for TV manufacturers, device manufacturers, uh, we really look forward to uh, working with you uh, to ensure that you are getting that logo and you're getting conformant and you're ensuring that the quality of service that we're transmitting is what's getting received on your devices. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Uh, it's really great to see the consumer focused marketing campaign that's been launched, which is a critical ingredient of a successful platform when backed with a rigorous certification process. And with that in mind, we're going to switch now to a presentation from Brian Markwater, uh, SVP Research and Standards at CTA. 
um, the Consumer Technology Association, who will describe the next gen TV logo scheme in more detail. Good morning. I'm Brian Mark Walter with the Consumer Technology Association. I'm happy to be presenting to you about next gen TVs and uh, what we believe is the right process for introducing TVs to this exciting new market uh, in the US and other places using the ATSC standard. Uh, I'm Senior Vice President of Research and Standards here at CTA. I'd like to note that we're probably best known for CES and that plays into our story here about launching TVs because CES, the trade show in January is one of the biggest launching grounds for products like TVs and in particular next gen TVs. So our next uh, CES will be all digital. It will be January 11th through 14th. Um, so please look for registration for that. It's open now. And I'm sure you'll see many exciting announcements there related to next gen TVs. OK, so with broadcasters introducing ATSC 3.0 services and the standard having been uh, wrapped up now for a couple of years, we're, we're, this year marks a point at which we're really introducing this wholly new uh, broadcast system that's integrated with the internet into the US market here. So the fundamental question is how do consumers find these TVs and know that they support ATSC 3.0? That was the question facing CTA and our TV manufacturers last year. So the answer is, of course, this isn't unusual that we need a, a way, a symbol that consumers can find quickly uh, that, that signifies that that TV is compatible with ATSC 3.0. So CTA created the logo you see here called Next Gen TV. Uh, we did quite a bit of research on this to, to get to this logo and uh, have trademarked it. And that, T, that logo is for use with TVs and other receivers like set-top boxes that passed the Next Gen TV test suite. That test suite was developed by Eurofans for CTA and National Association of Broadcasters, NAB. So we worked together, the whole ecosystem, CTA, the TV manufacturers, and NAB, the broadcasters, to uh, contract and develop a very robust test suite that is administered by Eurofans. So the logo that you see here is available by license from CTA. I'll explain some of those requirements momentarily. And then this whole, this logo allows everybody that's involved in the launch of Next Gen TV to promote it and help grow the market. So that's broadcasters and CTA together. So a little over uh, a year ago, at the end of 2019, CTA announced the availability of this Next Gen TV logo. As I mentioned, we had done research. So this was done through careful analysis of a bunch of different logos. We did consumer research. We uh, came up with this name and some usage guidelines for the logo. And that's how consumers will find uh, these products that are uh, compliant with ATSC through those services. So this was September of 2019. So moving the clock ahead a little bit, we came to CES uh, of 2020, so that was January CES in Las Vegas, our physical show early this year. And we saw numerous announcements, uh, three key manufacturers that already just falling on the heels of the announcement of the logo uh, announced their product lineups that would include next gen TV products. So Samsung introduced their lineup, Sony introduced a, a series of models that debuted at CES 2020, and LG, of course, introduced their lineup. All these TVs are available in the market now. Um, kind of tying this all together at CES 2020, there was a, a big release kind of press conference. NAB's President Gordon Smith and my, uh, my boss, Gary Shapiro, CEO, President and CEO of CTA, and Madeline, uh, Nolan, the ATSC president, all explained Next Gen TV in this, this launch. That's who you see here in the picture. And of course, as I mentioned, something like 20 models were introduced at CES and have subsequently been launched and are available at retail. 
I want to say a little bit about the market for next gen TV so that this isn't just about the process and the test suite itself, but to get you maybe a little bit excited about the market. So CTA does a great bit of forecasting and analysis of what's selling in the United States. So this is a snapshot from another presentation, another product we do, which is our, our forecast uh, completed in July. We'll be updating it soon. But I wanted to highlight kind of two features that are standing out this year just to give you a feel for what's going on here. So uh, 8K UHD TVs, as we know, are in, in the market. So now we have HD, 4K, and 8K. And you can see the, the growth of 8K. Um, on the right, you see next-gen TV. These are HSE 3.0 compatible TVs. And although they were just introduced and are just coming to market, uh, what you see is very quickly, in less than two years, the sales of next-gen TVs, we forecast to exceed the sale of 8K TVs. So that's exciting news for anyone interested in exploring next-gen TV. Okay, so a little bit of detail on how the logo program works. First, a TV manufacturer needs to sign the logo license agreement with CTA. So that's our license we provide that specifies what you need to do to put the logo on your TVs. And that license requires that you pass the Next Gen TV test suite, which is available under a separate license from Eurofins. So to be clear, Eurofins administers the test repository and the test suite. Uh, CTA licenses the logo, you license the test suite from Eurofins. So there's two licenses involved. Test your TVs, ensure they pass all the tests and submit those certification results to CTA. We will evaluate them. It's really just a spreadsheet that explains uh, the test results. And once we've approved, you can go to market with your next gen TV, applying the logo to the product and the box and your website. I do want to point out that the next gen TV test suite is not static. So this year, just in November, uh, not very long ago, CTA announced the new next gen uh, TV test suite for the 2021 model year TV. So if you're in the TV business, you understand that uh, during the course of say the summertime of, of this past year, you were nailing down your requirements for TVs that models that you will introduce early next year. And that's what this TV test suite aims for. So. Good afternoon, everyone, as mentioned, out that the next gen tv test suite is not static new next gen uh, tv test suite for the 2021 model year tv so if you're in the tv business you understand that uh, during the course of say the summertime of of this past year you were nailing down your requirements for tvs that models that you will introduce early next year and that's what this tv test suite aims for so We've released the updated test suite that will apply to 2021 model year TVs. And that really wraps up my presentation on the Next Gen TV logo, the marketplace, which now has multiple TV manufacturers and quite a lineup and is growing very quickly uh, for Next Gen TVs. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian. That was uh, that was very helpful, very interesting, and and I want to say a big thank you to the uh, National Association of Broadcasters (NAB) who have worked closely with us and CTA as stakeholders to help um, develop this test plan, and test material, and set the scope and prioritise what broadcasters are doing. Um, we saw a little sneak peek for just a moment ago. Sorry about that little technical gremlin, but um, we're now going to go to Ron Wheeler, uh, Managing Director of ATSC3's Security Authority, who are administering certificates and licenses for the security of the services and the content, the premium content that broadcasters want to put out over this exciting new platform. So over to Ron. 
Good afternoon, everyone. As mentioned, I'm Ron Wheeler. I'm the Managing Director of the ATSC 3.0 Security Authority, LLC. And I'm here to tell you, give you an overview of the A3SA content security ecosystem for uh, ATSC 3.0 broadcasts or next gen TV. I uh, hope you enjoy it. So before I uh, dive into uh, the um, products and services that A3SA uh, provides, just want to set the stage by talking a little bit about what happens every day on the internet, uh, reminding you really, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but it's about the use of uh, encryption and uh, um, digital signatures. So websites, as we all know, use encryption to secure the communications between web browsers and servers. Uh, they use SSL certificates uh, installed on the servers, and these certificates are digitally signed to authenticate the server's identity to the clients. Client certificates, in turn, are installed on laptops by corporations and uh, users, generally. Certificates, these certificates are also digitally signed to authenticate the employee or user's identity to the server. And finally, session keys are used to encrypt the data tra being transmitted from the server to the client. Um, if you uh, turning to app stores, uh, app stores also secure the apps that they they uh, sell and the delivery of those apps uh, by uh, digitally signing the apps themselves and um, uh, signing the the delivery of them. Video streaming apps themselves uh, also secure the content that they deliver to uh, users through encryption and licenses to prevent unauthorized viewing, copying, and distribution. Examples of these are Netflix, YouTube, and many other examples that we're all familiar with. So with that as background, let's talk a little bit about um, why A3SA was formed. Um, this is a, actually the um, a statement of purpose that's on our website, a3sa.com. And uh, the, the gist of it is uh, we wanted to bring the, all of those techniques that are used to secure uh, internet uh, OTT content and uh, websites and servers and so on, uh, and bring that all to ATSC 3.0 over the air broadcasts as well. And uh, the, by leveraging the same tools that web-based content services use, as mentioned, IP-based encryption protocols, device certificates, and rights management technology, all in conformance with the ATSC 3.0 security standard for ATSC 3.0 DTV, Next Gen TV. So there are two, two aspects to the services we provide. One of them is content protection, which involves encrypting the content, the broadcasts them, themselves, to protect against unauthorized redistribution or copying or uh, uh, and so on, misuse of the, of the content. Uh, and in this uh, uh, branch, we issue and apply licenses and cryptographic keys. And the important um, thing to remember about content protection is that it's entirely optional. It is permitted uh, in A360 um, as an underlying technology, but it is not mandatory. The second aspect that A3SA uh, has a jurisdiction over is service protection. And this involves the issuance and the validation of digital certificates to protect against spoofing, hacking, signal intrusion. Uh, these certificates allow receivers to, and other re reception products to verify that the broadcast signals and apps were broadcast by a trusted broadcaster and have not been changed. This service protection is actually mandatory. It's specified in A360 and A331, and it's required for, for signing both broadcast signals and apps. So uh, a few, a couple of slides on content protection. The first uh, branch that I just discussed, uh, content protection licenses are bound to a device or groups of devices, and they have rules uh, that are defined in policies. An example of these policies uh, are uh, involved duration of the license itself and playback of the content that is licensed, persistence, for offline viewing so that the content can still be viewed when uh, the device is offline. Track types, for example, audio, SD, HD, UHD quality video. Renewal parameters for renewing licenses when they upon expiration. They cover output protection, HTCP, DTCP, et cetera. And uh, of course, these only apply to devices that have output capability. Uh, they, they also address the security level where and how cryptography and our video processing is performed. Finally, they cover rules for content received via network input, um, you know, in other, words, other, words, other than by OTA. So they cover uh, license, licenses typically cover all of these uh, things. 
So uh, licenses also typically include some form of device certification uh, testing to ensure that all applicable compliance and robustness rules uh, are being followed by a licensed device at the time of submission for testing, uh, whether that testing is done by the licensee itself or by a third party um, test house, authorized test center, for example. Excuse me, security audits um, are also performed routinely to ensure that those rules are being followed by a licensed device is actually sold in the market. Um, so this is to ensure that there are no adv adverse changes to the device following its certification. Hack procedures are often used as well to ensure that hack devices, in other words, devices that are um, altered by users uh, in an unauthorized manner to, uh, to, to uh, uh, misbehave, if you will, uh, and violate the rules that, that these devices get identified and fixed if at all possible by the manufacturer. And finally, revocation of device credentials is a last resort means of turning off devices that violate the rules and aren't fixed um, as discussed. So turning to the second branch of uh, what A3SA does, service protection, uh, I'd like to discuss briefly the role of uh, public key infrastructure or PKI. PKI supports cryptographic signing, the digital signatures I mentioned earlier, through the issuance of X.509 digital certificates, which enable uh, two things. First, digital signatures for signaling tables. These are the broadcast signaling tables, uh, which tell receivers how to receive and display the content being broadcast. And digital signatures for broadcaster apps, uh, app signing by the author of the app and also app signing by the distributor or broadcaster that distributes the app. And both of these are as specified in A360 and A331. Um, the other thing the PKA does is to maintain uh, the certificate status uh, so that receivers can verify that the certificate being used is, for signing is valid. So there's a um, certificate revocation list or CRL. There's also an online certificate status protocol responder or OCSB. Both of these are repositories of this information uh, available to receivers. So uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, the role of digital signatures uh, um, uh, provides insurance, assurance that broadcaster signaling and applications are authentic. Uh, and in, in doing so, uh, these signatures prevent uh, man in the middle attacks, which, are, um, uh, which allow a receiver to verify that service is coming directly from a trusted source. So, uh, in, in our case, an FCC licensed broadcaster and not from a, a malicious third party in the middle. And it also uh, prevents rogue or malicious applications um, that are um, unsigned or missigned uh, so that um, a, a receiver can verify that the app it's being asked to install is authentic, meaning that it was created by an authorized party and distributed by an FCC licensed broadcaster. So what is A3SA? I'd like to uh, refer back to some of the concepts just discussed. Um, a A3SA is the co coordinating body for ATSC 3.0 content protection and security. We define requirements for content protection and security, including security against viruses and hacking. We define supplementary compliance and robustness rules, supplementary to those uh, in existing in um, uh, the uh, content protection technologies that we, that we make available. We create, establish, and maintain agreements with ecosystem participants. I'll say a little bit more about that in, uh, 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 down below. We function as the policy authority for that public key infrastructure I just discussed, which uh, covers, again, signing of broadcast signals and signing of broadcaster apps. We maintain the criteria for device certification, validation, and revocation that I mentioned earlier. We approve the test procedures and test companies and self-test requirements. We work hand in glove with the CTA's Next Gen TV certification and validation and logo program. And finally, we authorize uh, access to group and individual rights management licenses you know, from initially uh, Widevine and 3.0 model and device certificates from uh, Yanti, our vendor for those certificates. We operate on a cost recovery model, meaning that our startup costs uh, have been funded by our founders who are CBS, Fox, Pearl TV, Univision, Disney, ABC, and NBCU. And uh, we charge only modest annual and certification fees for, uh, to our licensees. And the uh, three categories of, of licensees are device manufacturers. And that agreement, uh, an interim version of it, 
uh, is available now and an updated and expanded version is coming very soon. Uh, broadcasters, and uh, that ver agreement has uh, been available for a short while now, but is available for any broadcaster to sign. Content participants, we do envision as being part of the ecosystem, uh, primarily as third-party beneficiaries of the uh, security requirements, and those are we expect to be coming next year. So just to uh, graphically depict the uh, participants in the A3SA um, ecosystem, you see uh, A3SA at the center of the uh, ecosystem, as uh, hopefully you would expect. And then just starting at the um, at the upper right, you see content owners and producers who produce the, the content, the ATSC 3.0 content. They, of course, license that content to broadcast ATSC 3.0 broadcasters. And uh, the broadcasters, in turn, license um, various um, encoders and, and, and so forth to encrypt the content from content protection vendors. Um, they also um, uh, license their digital certificates from PKI vendor, in this case, Ianti. And then the content is obviously received by device manufacturers, 3.0 receivers. And um, those, those devices uh, have, uh, have been uh, checked out and, and certified by Uh, license their digital certificates from PKI vendor, in this case, Ianti. And then the content is obviously received by device manufacturers, 3.0 receivers. And um, those, those devices uh, have, uh, have been uh, checked out and, and certified by independent test houses you see at the upper left. So that's our ecosystem. Um, we would love for uh, everyone watching this to, to uh, find the appropriate place in that ecosystem. And we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and uh, please do contact us uh, if you have any questions or require any further follow-up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, and uh, that was really helpful to explain uh, uh, A3SA's role. Um, I'm now going to quickly describe a little bit about what Eurofins have been doing and um, just show you a little bit about uh, the work that we've been putting together on test suites and so on. So um, we're extremely pleased that um, Eurofins has been trusted by CTA and NAB and A3SA to produce and distribute and manage the next gen TV and A3SA test suites. Um, we'd like to just explain a little bit about the structure of them first. Um, the next gen TV test suite has uh, three categories of test material, pending material, which is new and just been submitted um, for uh, further vetting and uh, and verification, then recommended material that's not mandatory to pass, but is uh, possibly a a, a, head, a head, heads up on new features that are coming soon um, to give manufacturers a chance to test against that in development, and then the approved material that's mandatory to pass to get the logo, and then A3SA's test suite covers the DRM and service security as Ron's just explained. So we have our next gen TV test repository at atsc3.cta.tech. Um, and I'm just going to quickly show that because uh, it's quite interesting to see if I can get it up. There we go. And um, you can see the uh, portal here and you can go into here to search and uh, download documents. Uh, there is the various um, important test uh, uh, certification reports and the test spec and um, you can uh, then download the test material from here. Um, the contents of the test, go, test suite at the moment uh, as noted it, it focuses really on the basic cases that uh, both Anne and others have talked about, watching TV and the various video formats that are supported, RF configurations and the interactive application APIs, and then Widevine DRM and TLS certificates are covered in the A3SA test suite. And that's evolving. So for future releases coming soon in December and into, new, into the next year, we're going to add more caption cases, ESG and ratings, advanced emergency alerting and information service and application signing, more interactive application APIs and life cycle tests, more audio and video cases and ad insertion. And as we said, this, this is a, 
ongoing process. So we have a current test suite applicable from now and devices going into the market that will be then superseded by a 2021 test suite for the devices that will enter the market in 2022. And then uh, as this process goes on, 2022 test suite comes out. So the certification process, um, two paths, manufacture self-tests or go to a registered test center and um, they can test for you, or we can test for you. Um, there's two components to that. There's the CTA license agreement and then the A3SA component that um, Ron has just explained. And eventually you submit your report to CTA to get the logo. Um, this is the test environment that we've um, got to work within that the um, test uh, system uses. So you need some means to uh, run the test material. The device under test has um, an RF input and an IP input, and then the testing API can communicate back to the test server to, um, to, to, to inform the status of the test and to um, get licenses for DRM and that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, the test report goes to the certification body who awards the logo. So how to get started. First step, contact CTA for the logo license agreement. And there's contact details there. there. Also contact A3SA um, for the DRM service security agreement. Contact us for test suite license agreements. Um, then we can add you to the test repository so you can um, look at the materials and download it. You can create accounts, download the materials, and so on. So we've also produced um, Arios for ATSC, a complete lab environment for um, developers and QC teams implementing ATSC3 receivers and components. It's able to manage uh, the next gen TV and A3SA test plans, and it provides generation of those test reports to submit to the authorities, and it automates and uh, is evolving its playout capabilities as the test material evolves. So it will continue to support all the test material. And here are the components of that test, test system. This is how it looks. And it um, has uh, information here about the test and the status. And you can see the video uh, here in the slide and uh, lots of information embedded in the test material about what's being tested and how it's being tested. So that really helps developers and the QA teams understand the test process. We also offer an RF receiver test service and um, using specialist equipment, we'll test against the RF uh, test performance test plan from the ATSC that's necessary and really important part of um, making sure a decoder is ready for the market. So we have, I think, summarized all, all of our um, services here. We've got um, test material that we've talked about. We've got the Arios test harness and then various test services. So uh, um, RF testing, as well as capture and emissions validation, application testing and other types of um, testing that we can offer the ATSC3 ecosystem. And finally, a reminder, go and have a look at watchnextgentv.com. It's a great new website aimed at consumers and um, is uh, uh, really doing a great job of s explaining the system and, and what NextGenTV offers consumers and how to get um, access to it. And with that, um, I think we're done. And um, I'll just stop that. And we'll take some questions. So first question I've got here is, um, does a device require both the next gen logo certificate to get the A3SC certificate or vice versa, or can you get one or the other? Well, the A3SC part is optional. Um, it's obviously optional to get the next gen TV logo as well, but um, you don't need the A3SA certificate to get the next gen TV logo. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. Um, so we'll wrap up here. I want to thank everybody and thank all our speakers. So thank you to Madeline Noland. Thank you to Brian Markwalter. Thank you to Anne Shelley and to Ron Wheeler. Um, 
we really appreciate your your presentations and um, for those of you who have questions you're watching on demand please send them through we'll get to them and feed back to you after the event and um, with that thank you very much everybody and recordings will be available later on thank you all and goodbye